A very good evening and a warm welcome to each and every one of you joining us today. Every week I have the great pleasure to have a meaningful conversation with global thought leaders, speakers, authors and coaches. Today it gives me great pleasure to host John Baldoni, who's listed as one of the global gurus and the top 30 leaders globally. He's also part of the MG100 Coaches. He's written over 14 books. In fact, his 15th book, Grace Notes, has just been released. And it's all about the pandemic from a leadership perspective. So welcome, John. Well, uh, thank you, Gautam. It's a pleasure to be with you. And to all of our viewers in India, hello. So, well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Which city are you based in, John? I'm in Ann Arbor. I'm in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, which is in uh, our Midwest here. And uh, it's, a, it's a little bit earlier than it is in um, Mumbai, uh, but it's a good, good morning start. So, Fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks for being with us. Um, a mutual friend of many of ours here in India, Marshall Goldsmith, speaks very highly of you. So I'm really grateful that we're having this chance to, to have a conversation together. And hopefully this is the beginning uh, of a new future together as well. Well, uh, my, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. All, so many good things come from our friend Marshall. Uh, don't they, uh, got him? So. Absolutely. His whole paid forward community and the MG sort of legacy projects uh, speaks for itself and it's making waves globally. Well, he's, Marshall has been a terrific influence on me and I've learned a great deal from him and I'm honored to call him a friend. So. Excellent, excellent. I can see from your background and you've just launched the new book, Grace Notes, recently. So, um, you know, why did you write this book? I'm intrigued, you know, Grace Notes. Uh, the title itself arouses curiosity. So well, I'd love to, to hear. Well, thank you, Gautam. Um, Grace Notes came out of a series of videos that I did last year during as our pandemic was hitting. And I dealt with the issues that um, our clients were dealing with, uh, fear, isolation, dislocation. But I also saw glimmers of hope. Um, I saw the empathy. I saw resilience, all of the things that were uh, leaders were doing to bring people together. Um, and so I said, I have to capture this stuff. So I, I did. And then I just said, you know, this could be a little book. So Grace Notes, which actually comes out on June 1st, but is available now uh, via Amazon, um, is a my statement on what uh, we all experience because the reason got them, we have been through a tremendous crisis and we're, it's still going on. Until we digest this, until we put it into perspective, I don't think we can grow from it. And so that's why I wrote the book. Fantastic. No, very, very timely. Uh, the pandemic, we thought a year later we'd be through the worst of it. But at least at this part of the world, India, it's uh, we're in the thick of it currently. So I think it's a very time, timing, great timing of the book as well. Well, thank you. And and the thing is, is, is even as we move out of the medical crisis form, Gautam, there are still issues. Uh, people, the whole idea of the how going back to work, what does it mean? You know, uh, our senior leaders say, I want everybody back in the office, but rank and file are saying, hey, you know, I've been pretty productive where I am. I want to stay where I am. And so, and this trend about working from anywhere, as you well know, God, had been started well before the pandemic. The pandemic yeah. simply accelerated it. So um, we're going to see all kinds of uh, uh, new ways of working. And the thing I tell my clients is that plan as, as diligently as you can, but be ready to replan and plan again once we get back into a kind of a new normal because we it's yet to be discovered so absolutely I, I resonate with what you shared and and the speed of change nowadays you've really got to be nimble on your feet and willing to adapt be flexible um you know both from a leadership perspective as well as your teams as an organization um and and i've heard very much similar feedback from from clients when i say you know if and when the pandemic is over they're like, we're not going to go back to that form of style of working because we found a way to be productive. And in people talking of a hybrid model to some extent, you know, some kind of blend between the the old way of working and 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 sort of the virtual space, you know. Right. And the hybrid workplace, um, I think, is what we're going to see a lot of for office workers. Now, you know, our healthcare workers, our uh, so many other workers need to work 
face to face as they always have. So yeah. we need special uh, rec, uh, special call out for them because they've been carrying the load. Same thing with factory workers or our retail workers, restaurants, all of these things, entertainment. So it's not going to be a virtual world <laughs> by any no, other. But but um, I think some of the things that are applying to office workers who can work remotely, some theorists are saying. Could we do this for our factory workers? Could we do this for our healthcare workers? And more and more, I mean, a lot of, at least here in the US, healthcare workers, um, I know nurses can work um, three 12 hour shifts and that's a week right. work. So um, we're, we're reinventing work, um, Gautam. And I like to say that's a positive, but as with all things, birthing pains um, can be painful. <laughs> so. Right. No, absolutely, absolutely agree with you, with you, John. And I guess things will unfold in the coming weeks and coming months, uh, if not coming years as well, with the way things are unfolding. You know, absolutely, absolutely. Great. I mean, from your book, I notice it's uh, you've got a unique style in uh, in the way you've written this book. Uh, could you share some insights into? into the style of writing this book? Well, originally, um, it, it, this book is in, unfolds. It's very short. It's only 72 pages. And it's more prose poetry. And while I am someone who cannot rhyme two lines, <laughs> uh, the, the emphasis is on prose. But the idea of poetry, it's a short, concise thought. And it get, captures the mood of a moment. And so the book is intended, uh, I mean, some of my advanced readers have read it cover to cover, but I think, Gautam, it's a way of just grabbing a thought here about isolation or about connection or about rebuilding. Uh, quick thoughts to think about how we um, go forward together. Uh, and uh, so it's my attempt to put that. I've also illustrated it with my photography, uh, which was my original avocation many, many years ago, and I've gone back to it. So I've had some fun uh, doing that. So Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to reading the book. It sort of resonates with me when I wrote my book, Breaking Bread, as just 100 pages. And, and I really thought, you know, we want to, you know, it's not about the quantity uh, as much to me today. People's attention spans are also not, not, not strengthening. They're actually shortening in many ways. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and very, very true. A, a, a colleague of mine who's a mega, mega million selling author said, you want to write a book that where you get on the plane in Orlando and you finish it by the time you get to Atlanta. And so the, those of you, and that's about an hour flight right there. So your book and my book right, fit right in there. Got them. But yeah, at the yeah. same time, just because it's short and concise doesn't mean it's less meaningful. Um, the intention of my book, and I know yours too, is to give people things to consider. As um, you know from our coaching world, what I often say is that we will work together for six months or a year, but the lessons of coaching should last for you for years into the future. And I think you and I would hope that for our, our writing, the same thing. So. Absolutely agree, and I, I like the the idea of the flight from one state to the other. That one hour, that that's exactly why I wrote the book. And uh, you know, one of my great friends, who's an author based in Dubai, and he says, you know, he really advocates less is more. It it, it really you can say a few things and say them so well that they create a lasting, long impact um, that that transforms someone. And as you say, if you're inspiring them, you're thought provoking, you're making making them think, um, review. Um, rethink um, and, and prompt perhaps some in inspired action, then that's the job, you know, the book well written. Right. Uh, and, and that's, uh, and there's another uh, link to Grace Notes after I had put it together and I realized uh, my other avocation um, is piano. Um, and I went back to that again in my uh, later career, I played as a child, uh, not well, <laughs> and not and not willingly, uh, but I had, uh, but I lear learned some of the basics. And so, in music, Grace Note is a flourish, um, and um, I'm a, an aficionado of jazz. And so often, sometimes people will say, "Well, jazz is the series of wrong notes." And so, certainly in my life, <laughs> I've certainly hit a lot of wrong notes. So. Grace notes to me has a meaning of the concept of grace, the greater goodness, but also our human frailty, as well as our ability to go forward and make music out of the life that we have, if you will.
Fantastic. Now, really, really looking forward to reading it and uh, and uh, enjoying the book. So thanks and congratulations. And I like the fact that you've got the visual part of it because, you know, pictures also speak a thousand words. We've heard it, you know, so with the visuals, with the poetry, with the stories, um, I'm sure it'll be a very inspirational read. So looking forward to that. Well, thank you. So ha having said that, you've also written about loss. And I'm curious to know why do you include loss in your writing as well? Well, I think it's part of um, if we're going to make sense of what we've been through, Gotham, we have to address the series of so, the sense of loss. Certainly right. loss is most evident if we've lost uh, loved ones or colleagues. But in a metaphorical sense, we've lost our way of life. The world of January 2020 is no more and is not coming back. So right. it's appropriate to mourn for it. And other people have lost, uh, you know, so often when this crisis struck, people the big word uh, we often heard uh, got them was pivot. And I know you in the speaking business, I mean, your whole physical presence was turned upside down. So uh, you were very successful in pivoting to a virtual world or and now coming out in, in, in new ways. So, but all of us weren't ready for that pivot yet. So there's that loss and some are still digesting that. So we have to acknowledge a sense of loss. It's okay to mourn for it because only in mourning for it will we move forward. And so that doesn't mean wallow in misery but it means right. acknowledging where we have been. So. Yeah, yeah. I think it reson It sort of triggers me to think about acceptance because only when we, when we accept um, the new reality of what's happening can we move on and focus our energy on the, on the way forward. So, Absolutely. Um, excellent. Thank, thanks for sharing, John. Um, in your book, you mentioned rebuilding. Um, what do you mean by rebuilding? Well, that was inspired by someone you know very well, and that's Mark uh, Thompson, who's a fellow yes. member of MG100. And Mark was talking one day about um, rebuilding in a physical sense, but he said, if you're gonna do it, do it better than before. And, and that's, I think, where we're at right now. And I like to say that the values that we held in January 2020 will be the values that we hold in our new normal as we create it, we're beginning to create it now. And so just as you would uh, have a business that, that has you know, fallen on hard times, you're gonna build it better than before with what you have learned. And I think building it better also gets into the concept of resilience. And that's something I talk about in the book, whereas I've always thought of resilience as bending, not breaking. Um, right. And that definitely is true, coming through adversity. But as I discuss in the book, and it's a wonderful concept from the, a colleague, um, Eileen McDard, uh, and another colleague, Jesse Lynn Stoner, who talk about bouncing forward. And again, if we look at our world as going to be new, we, we have to adapt. We will be reformed and reshaped, but we still have our virtues, our strengths, and that'll help us cope and deal with the world going forward. Fantastic. No, thanks for sharing that. Again, you know, it re reaffirms with me, with my team. My team said, how should we position ourselves? We've got so much experience. I said, I'd like you to take the mindset of we're a startup with 28 years experience because experience and branding is one thing. But in this world now, we're seeing startups who are suddenly flourishing because they've got no, no barriers. They've got no past references. There, there are no rules to some extent. So I what? said, you know, we need to take the mindset as a startup, but the foundation can be 28 years experience. And that's sort of the mindset of the way we are rebuilding as an organization. That's such a wonderful concept. I, I wish I would have heard that. I would have put it in because you, you talked <laughs> about your past experience and your foundation and that rather than view it as, oh, that's old world. No, it's your it's what you've learned and how you can adapt to the new world. So great thought. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. The, the last thing I want to do is rest on years of experience and assume that's that deserves the new business. That's not going to get you new business because you've been in business for 20, 30, 40 years. We're right. in fact seeing some of the longer companies struggling, struggling in this pandemic because they're holding on to um, the years of experience and not able or willing to pivot. So, And, you know, that's a very good point. And it relates to the sense of loss. 
um, mm. as our friend Marshall always talks about, is letting go of the past. There are virtues in our past, and we should celebrate that. But if we're going to move forward, let's not get so hung up on it. It's like it's the way we've always done it. Um, there are virtues in that, but we have to adapt. And, and life, I mean, we've been forced to make a radical change in the pandemic. But right. wouldn't you agree, Gautam, that life is always about change? And so you, hanging on too much to the past, even in the best of times, is not always a healthy thing. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, one, one of my dad's best advices he gave to me as a teenager was, the two things that are constant in life are change and challenges. And no matter no matter what level of success you achieve as a professional, as an entrepreneur, realize that change and challenges are going to be constant. And, um, you know, the degree of change and challenges may be at its optimum in the last year, no doubt. Um, but we are, you know, that is part of the of the culture of business and, and being in, in this sort of corporate world as well. Without question. And what a great thing. Change and challenge. That's a good thought. So, a good <laughs> mantra for <laughs> life. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that led on to my dad's advice, which I shared in my book. He says, you know, when you when you come across change and challenges, the three things that I have that I recommend you and everyone applies, surround yourself with the right people, people who inspire you, engage you and educate you continuously learn, uh, learn from blogs, podcasts, books, and above all, take action. If you apply these three three rules, you will have breakthroughs and you will have solutions to the challenges. So um, really applying that in today's world that we're living in. Absolutely. What, what great advice. And, um, and you know, and, and I like the, the sense of that is digesting what's going on and then acting upon it. And that's what entrepreneurs do all the time. It's what's the context and how do I adapt? How do I execute? And then how do I re quote if there is such a word, re-execute or redo? To make to refine my product as you are doing with your business and challenging your people to adapt. So yeah, yeah, great. I mean, you've written fourteen previous books, uh, John. Uh, but how does this particular book relate to your previous work? Well, I, I, my previous book to this was Grace: a, a Leader's Guide to a Better Us, which is about this the power of grace as a catalyst for the greater good. And I talked about the virtues of grace: generosity, respect, and and uh, compassion and how leaders use that to uh, act and to mobilize things for positive action. And my previous, and it links to my previous work on per, on this topic of purpose. Purpose is our why, as Simon Sinek uh, said, and many others too, that purpose focuses us on, and if you look at it from an organizational, even a personal sense, purpose is our why is is our why and it sparks our vision which is our sense of becoming uh purpose is also sparks our mission which is our building and and now let me introduce the concept of grace you and i both know that you can build a business even a successful business in spite of people <laughs> you, you know <laughs> but how how much better is it gotham to bring people with you and that's where grace comes in. And grace becomes the avenue for our sense of belonging, which is our value system. So grace, excuse me, purpose is our how. Grace, excuse me, <laughs> purpose is our why. Grace is our how. And we absolutely need the how and the why in, in every every sense of the world, you know. Great. Yes. In, 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 in closing, before I share a couple of questions uh, that I have personally for you, anything else you'd like to share with the audiences today about your current work and, and how they can sort of respond and deal with the current sort of fast changing work environment? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because, and it's, it gets back to the reason I wrote Grace Notes, is uh, the first thing is to take a deep breath and say, I'm here, we're here we have survived. I would like to say at least I'm mentally stronger than I was before. And if not, I will be that way. So give yourself a pat on the back for the survival, but also credit yourself for what you have achieved in this past year. Um, many of us, I think in, in many ways, we may kind of sh shut aside what we've been through. But I think if you think back, 
like you have reinvented your business or on a personal level, what changes have you made? Have you reconnected with friends? Do you have deeper relationship with family? All of those things are worthy of note and of celebration. So I think the overall message of Grace Notes, while it, it, it captures our the year, time that we're going through the past year plus, and there are ups and downs, but the, where it begins in a kind of sense of darkness when we had the shutdown, we are now coming into a period of light. And so it's more open and we have survived. So. Absolutely. No, thank you for those, those golden words and, and really resonate with that advice. I've got a lot to be grateful for as I look back at the last year. I mean, writing a book was definitely something that you had a lot of time for. You had more time with our families. Uh, more more conversations with with family members and even virtually I felt you could connect with people a lot more frequently than you were physically able to without uh, question yes without question and um, so there's a lot of lot to be grateful for in the last last year in fact it's put everything in perspective many things simple things like food shelter and family we took that as routine and for granted um, and we're always looking to the outside world and the speed of things of travel and everything else and now you sort of get a chance to press pause, reflect, review, and, and just live with an abundance of gratitude. So, so thank you for sharing, John. Great, my honor. Great. Great. So I wrote the book Breaking Bread uh, just, just, over, just over a year back, actually, just under a year rather. And what is breaking bread? When you hear someone say the word breaking bread, what does that mean to you? Well, it, it, at, on its base level, it means um, sharing a meal with someone. On a deeper level, it means sharing an experience, sharing something of yourself. And that's the kind of uh, sense that you bring is we're, we're in this together and we can learn from one another. So. Absolutely. No, thank you very much uh, for that definition. It's, it's very, very apt and appropriate. Could you share? I mean, you've had the pleasure. Sorry, you were going to share something. I'm sorry. Oh. I said you've had the pleasure of breakfast, lunch, dinner with many great, great people over the years, be it thought leaders, authors, CEOs. Do you have a breaking bread story, perhaps, that you could share? Which, when you look back, you reflect and like, wow, that that lunch or that dinner triggered a phenomenal transformation, be it a personal relationship, be it the MG100 community. Um, is there any dinner or any meal or an experience that you can look back and say, that, that was a breaking bread experience for you? Well, you know what? I, if you, it, and let's keep it in, in the world that both of us know, I mean, it was me meeting Marshall uh, more than, you know, early in this this century, and then Marshall, I you know stayed in contact with him, and then MG One Hundred Marshall Goldsmith One Hundred Coaches formed, and I was invited to become a member of that, and and then through that, what the real meaning of that? It's it's more than Marshall; it's the community that we have uh, have created, and it's all of us are uh, have one uh, guiding principle, and that's to share, and that's to learn from one another, and so. That's, that is an essence of a positive life, of sharing with someone else. Uh, and, uh, and the more you give, the more you receive. I know that sounds like a cliche at times, but um, it, it, it's really true. So. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you very much, John, for this valuable conversation. And we look forward to hosting you virtually to you know, corporate clients here in the Gulf and the Indian subcontinent. And when the time is right, we look forward to hosting you in person live uh, in this part of the world. But we'll definitely look to connect virtually with you and share your message and the value that you can create to corporates uh, in this part of the world. Thank you very much. Any closing comments that you'd like to share before we wrap up, John? Well, I want to say thank you for inviting me and to the audience. Um, um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to spend, thank you for spending some time with me. And again, I want to reiterate that message that um, we have survived and we will continue to survive and let's hope that we thrive. So. Thank you so much, John. I encourage each and every way to connect with John Baldoni on LinkedIn. He's a phenomenal thought leader and I recommend you connect with him. You also have a chance to get a copy of his book, Grace Notes. Um, it's available on Amazon. It's a short, easy read, but rest assured, an inspirational one, which I highly recommend. Thank you very much, John. It's been an absolute pleasure.
and thank you.